American West. Once it could have been the British, Spanish, or even the Russian West. It became American primarily because of the explorations of two young army officers, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. Their pioneering journey stands as one of the great achievements in the history of the United States. Clark? Here's Sergeant Ordway. Sir, there's no more trail up ahead. Uh, no more trail. That's right, sir. Halt! Closer! Sutton, Cruzat, pass the word. Halt! Halt! Bless you, Webb! What's the matter up here, Billy? Ordway says we've run out of trail. Well, let's have a look, Sergeant. Yes, sir, Captain Lewis. Even the big orange sheep would have trouble with this pass. His guy told Toby and his son aren't doing very well. Hardway, go back to Toby. Find out what's wrong. Yes, sir. Toby's supposed to know the Nez Perce Trail from the Missouri to the Columbia, according to Chief Kamiawait. The chief told Sacagawea, his own sister, that Toby and his four boys were reliable. I can't understand Well, it. they did get us through the Lemai. And three of the sons deserted. When, when old Toby and the other boy planned to leave us. Look at that trail, Merriweather. Narrows to about six inches. And the drop-off stays the same, about a thousand feet. Captain, Toby swears this is right. He says maybe a slide partially blocked the trail. And I guess we'll have to take his word for it. We'll cut a path. Sergeant, break out those axes. Yes, sir. Bratton, Kohler, Shields, Collins... Bring your axes. Widen that trail to three feet. Give those horses a little leg room in there. All right, pull back. Well, I don't see anything but cliffs up ahead. I hope Toby's right. It's supposed to be a mountain valley not far from here. The uh, the country of the Flathead Indians. No more room up here. <coughs> Keep those horses back. <coughs> hold them. <coughs> that one, hold them, I said. He's going over. Are you men? Hang on to the rest of those horses, you understand? Talk to them. Calm them down. Cruzette, what was on that horse that fell? Most of our food, sir. Horizons Web, the continued story of the Lewis and Clark Expedition. Now, with Harry Bartell as Meriwether Lewis and John Anderson as William Clark, listen to Chapter 7, To the Pacific. <laughs> September, 1805. The Lewis and Clark expedition struggled along the Nez Perce Trail, a winding footpath that skirted the rugged Bitterroot Mountains along the border between present-day Montana and Idaho. Horses slipped and fell and broke equipment. Men cursed and chopped a trail in the sides of cliffs where weather had eroded the path. There was no food, animal or vegetable, in this cold, wind-blown country almost 7,000 feet above sea level. Neither Lewis nor Clark, plodding along at the head of a hungry, weary band, was sure they would ever find the Lolo Pass, which was supposed to be the gateway to the headwaters of the Columbia. The morning of September 3rd, 1805, the expedition awakened to a sleet storm and low temperature. Morning, Captain Clark. Uh, 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 it's cold, York. Come on, wake up. Wake up. Oh, oh I see white. Hello, Billy. Good morning to you, York. Get the uh, get the men up, York. Get those baggage covers thought out. Yes, sir. Tell the sergeants to detail men to rub down the horses. I don't want any animals slipping off the trail because he's too numb to know where he's putting his feet. Yes, sir. Billy Clark and I kept the men moving, and it was lucky that the trail was appreciably wider. 
because the sleet was now blowing across the mountain with the force of a gale. It took us most of the day to travel five miles. Along toward evening, the path started downhill, the storm faded away, and we could see a mountain valley below. On the floor of the valley were the lodges of an Indian village. Looks like old Toby was right. That could be the Flathead village. Looks deserted. Maybe the people are staying inside to keep warm. Uh, that big lodge, a couple of men just came out. You're right, sir. They're looking this way, pointing at us. The two men were joined by others who came in twos and threes from the different lodges to watch our approach. Ordway, Ordway, ask Sacagawea if she can talk to these people. The Selish or Flathead Tongue was vastly different from Shoshone and most other Indian dialects Sacagawea explained to us. She was sorry, but she had no knowledge of it. We were forced to call upon George Druyar, exponent of the Plains Country Sign Language. We moved into the village where we stopped before a group of excited warriors, including one who wore three eagle feathers and looked like a chief. We made the universal sign of peace, which they understood, but seemed not to believe after looking at York. The chief and George Druyar spoke to each other in sign language. His name is Three Feathers. He's worried about the York's war paint. War paint? Uh, yes, sir. A strange white tribe with no blankets rides in with their biggest warrior painted black. Oh. That is very bad medicine. Explain that York's natural skin is black, just as ours is white and theirs is red. Tell them our blankets are in our packs. Although he tried, George seemed unable to make Three Feathers understand. Finally, in despair, he turned to York. York, uh, how about letting Three Feathers try to rub off the black paint, huh? Others did that to me. Shoshone, Mandan. Ain't gonna put up with no more insults. <laughs> no insult, York. Three Feathers has never seen black skin before. You can be patient with his ignorance, York. To save us all trouble and maybe killing. All right, sir. This once I'll put up with their ignorance for the sake of the corn. George indicated York's massive arm. Three feathers advanced and vigorously tried to rub off the war paint. When he couldn't, he relaxed and gave us all a grin of fellowship. Hmm. Someday I'm going to break somebody's ignorant head wide open. York was mollified, however, when a crowd of squaws and young men gathered to admire his height and his broad shoulders. He even took off his shirt so they could get a better look at his muscular body. Three Feathers ordered robes spread in the lodge, and upon his invitation, Billy Clark and I entered along with George Drouillard. George, uh, this will be the pipe ceremony after it's over... Maybe you could bring up the subject of horses. Yes, sir. We want to make up for the ones we lost. Huh? All right. Uh, I guess we uh, sit over here. Uh, no, sir. It's over here. Uh. Three feathers and his minor chieftains entered and sat. The chief lit a pipe and passed it to Billy Clark. I smoke to peace. To good trading. White man... Black man. Selish. In an amiable mood, Three Feathers went into a long harangue of friendship. And as he talked, we could understand what Sacagawea meant when she said the Selish tongue was different. It was sort of a brogue, complete with rolled R's. It reminded me of Welsh and of the old legend that says that America was discovered by the Welsh who then disappeared into the interior of the continent and became a tribe of white Indians. I took out pencil and paper and jotted down the sounds as best I could. It would make an interesting bit of philology to show to Mr. Jefferson. We acquired nine good horses from the Flatheads and got directions to the Lolo Pass, which jibed with old Toby's. Despite his indecisive ways, old Toby was proving to be a tolerable guide. We moved down valley to a fork of the Bitterroot River. 
where we stop to make camp and prepare for the rigors of the low, low pass. Unsaddle the neck! Throw the back, Abe! Captain Lewis, Captain Clark. Mm. Good fire you have going now. Yes, sir, but... Make another one just for warmth. Yes, sir, but what I cook? No flour? No corn? Nothing, sir. I sent George Druyar out with a rifle and a pack horse early this morning, right after we left the flathead. Well, then we can hope George is a mighty fine hunter. But there ain't no game to shoot. Excuse me. Uh, where do you think you're going? To pick your supper, sir. Wild choke cherries. I'd rather go hungry. I'm just in time. <laughs> Now, will you gentlemen look at that fine deer Mr. Drouillard's got on that horse? Ain't he a pretty hunter? If you'll excuse me, I'll just heft this fine meat off the horse and take it over the way it'll do the most good at my cooking fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming through, George. You sure boosted morale. I shot it one hour ago when I was on my way back. Empty hand it. <laughs> we named the camp. Traveler's Rest. We spent two days preparing for the Lolo Pass, resting the horses, repairing equipment. On September 12th, we left Traveler's Rest and began climbing the rugged crags of the Bitterroots. When we reached the 7,000-foot summit of the Lolo Pass, it began to snow. For three days, the weather worsened, and it was a miracle that we didn't lose any men or animals. On the 17th, we began to come out of the mountains. Billy, it's a little warmer. I'm glad to be out of that snowstorm. Oh, so am I. We've got to solve this food problem soon. Lower altitudes and warmer weather ought to mean that we can find some game. Why don't I take George Duryar and the other hunters and uh, push ahead? <laughs> Next morning, I was off early with Sergeant Gass, George Drouillard, Reuben Fields, George Shannon, and Johnny Coulter. Two days of ranging the country netted one wild horse, which we left hanging from a tree for the main party. A few hours later, we encountered two wandering villages of Nez Perce Indians. Through Drouillard's sign language, we talked to them, and they seemed honest and friendly. They sold us surplus food, dried salmon and camas bread made from roots. We packed this on a horse and sent Rube Fields back to the main party with it. Then we moved on, seeing some signs of game, and finally came to the headwaters of a large river. We made camp a few miles from where the Nez Perce had set up their lodges. Captain Clark, uh, there is a uh, Nez Perce warrior want to see you. Oh? About what? He has bad legs. Wants it uh, cured with the white man's magic. Well, I'll be glad to try. Drouillard moved beyond my fire where a young Nez Perce waited, hunched over in pain. I watched the motion of his leg, trying to diagnose what was wrong with it as he limped over towards me. Ask him where the pain is, George. I speak white man talk. Oh. Nim come come ish. Uh, I'm Captain Clark. Now, uh, where does your leg hurt? Uh, here. And here. Mm-hmm. The thigh. And the bend of the knee. Uh, lie down in this blanket. Yes. Lie down. I'm going to pull the leg hard, and it will hurt. And then we'll get well. Then it will get well. Then come, come, he's ready. Who? Uh, George, brace his shoulders. Yes, sir. All right, boy. Now, you remember, this will hurt. I take you by the ankle with both hands. See? Come, come, he's see. All right. Now. There, there, there. Now, soon the strain will go. Uh, George, there's a bottle of liniment in my pack. Get it, William. Yes, sir. Come, come, Ish. Where did you uh, learn white man's talk? Many sleeps ago. Come, come, Ish, in country of Chinooks, near Columbia. Chinooks try to kill. Mm-hmm. White trap a man from north drive Chinooks away. They keep me two moons. 
till they cure Woon from Chinook Spear. I'm glad the trappers helped you. Uh, here is the liniment, sir. Come, come, Ish. I'm going to rub this into your leg. It may feel like it's burning at first, but that'll go away and your leg will be much better. Can come, Ish. Uh, grateful. You go to big stinking sea? Chinook country? Yes, uh... This river, uh, I call it the Clearwater, does it run to the Columbia? Use canoe, sometimes portage, but uh, good most way for boot. I see. Now, here, come, come, take this bottle. Rub the liquid in like I did every day until the bottle is empty. Uh, thank you. White man, very good. I speak good words to my people. The day Merriweather and the main party joined us, we brought in four deer. Unfortunately, it was more than enough meat because Merriweather and his party were unable to eat. The sudden change to a diet of dried salmon and camas roots had given them all dysentery. Nevertheless, Merriweather insisted upon making plans for the resumption of water travel as soon as he had seen the river. You say the clear water is navigable and leads to the Snake River, and that takes us into the Columbia. Well, there are rapids. There'll be portages. Nothing as bad as the Great Falls of the Missouri, I hope. Nothing could be that bad. I told Sergeant Gass to select trees to make into good, strong dugouts. Maybe the Nez Perce will have a guide or two to add to old Toby. Somebody with local information. I hope so. Uh, they've agreed to look after our horses until we come back. Well, Sergeant Pryor in a detail can round up the horses and brand each one. In the space of less than two weeks, the ailing members of our party recovered. The horses were branded and entrusted to the Nez Perce. And our new dugouts were ready for the journey downriver. And our Indian friends provided two chieftains who would accompany us, at least part of the way, Twisted Hare and Tito Harsky. Morel was high when we started down the clear water on the 7th day of October, 1805. Captain Clark, it's a treat just to be riding a boat. No towing, no pulling. Not even any rowing to speak of. Hey, what about steering, Sergeant? Hey, what's the gas doing up ahead? What are you getting at, Cousat? Well, Sergeant Odway, better look sharp. There's fresh water ahead. Drop it to you. It looks to me like gas is making a proper approach. Sir, he's too close to those rocks in a new and untried boat. Gas? Look out! Look out! Gas's dugout seemed to be drawn to the rock like a piece of metal to a magnet. It struck, cheated in the current, slammed into a second rock, and started to sink. Hang on to the rock, you men! Hold the boat! Most of our non-swimmers were in Gas's boat. Now they behaved with rare presence of mind, following Cruzat's bellowed instructions. Pull your boat close! Hang on to us! We'll take you in! The men obeyed. Our oars flashed out, and Cruzat steered to the beach in safety. An examination showed a split in the forward portion of Gas's canoe. Looks to me like it was made too thin. Uh, we can read Get at it, then. And get that deer in the sun to dry. York! York! Here, sir. Where's old Toby? Why, well, I saw him and his boy heading up river as fast as they laid the chicken, sir. Go find Captain Lewis. Tell him Toby's run away. I know. I know. They ran east without paying any attention to me. Or to me either, sir. Uh, this morning, old Toby was pretty scared of the dugout. He say he do not like the big water. I guess we've seen the last of him. Lucky we've got Twisted Hair and Tito Harsky to guide us. York, if you feel like making the fire, the Captain Luis and I shot some blue teal. Teal? That's good. What about <laughs> bigger game? Any signs? Not a thing. Looks to me like we're going to have to become salmon eaters, like the Indians. We continued down the clear water into the Snake River, where we overturned three canoes in fast water, but suffered no lasting damage from the accident. What bothered us most were the persistent reports from friendly Indians that the nearer we came to the ocean, the more unfriendly and dishonest the natives. 
Also, at this season, food was scarce, except for dried salmon, which was kept in large quantities by all the tribes. Despite these intelligences, when we actually turn from the snake into the Columbia, we yell congratulations from boat to boat. The Columbia! The Columbia! Columbia! Good beach ahead. Lay in the shore. Lay in the shore. Lay in the shore. Throw that baggage. York. York, let's have a fire. Yes, sir. What is it, Scanner? What's the matter, boy? Up on the hill, sir. Indians. Down, they are going down. All right, everybody make the peace sign, but be ready for trouble. I managed to keep my big dog, Scannon, from attacking the newcomers, a band of Yakimas, by chaining him to a tree. The Yakimas, a small scouting party, were all smiles and amiability. They had seen Sacagawea and Little Baptiste, proof to them that we came in peace. No war party ever would encumber itself with a squaw and a papoose. We smoked together and in sign language, Druya invited them back after dark to watch our men dance. <laughs> the Yakimas returned that night. Two wore red British army coats, and a third sported an American Navy pea jacket. These had been purchased from Indians to the West, who had originally acquired the goods from the trading ships which occasionally put into the mouth of the Columbia. Our guests watched the dancing with the light. Say, Captain Clark, nobody's going to top Sergeant Gass unless York gets out here. <laughs> Go on, York. Give us the old Kentucky stuff. All right, sir. I'll do it. Here we go, men. Keep that fiddle going, Mr. Kuzak. Tonight, I feel like stomping. <laughs> oh, look at him. Look at him go. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> I was wrong about the Kentucky stop. This is brand new. This is the uh, Yakima stop. <laughs> The Yakimas were amazed and delighted by our music and dancing, especially York's solo turn. One of the chiefs told us in signs interspersed here and there with an English word that we would always be welcome as brothers among the Yakimas, and we promised to visit them upon our return. On October 22nd, we approached the Salilo Falls of the Columbia. We camped above them, and Cruzat and I went to reconnoiter. Looks bad, Captain. Cruzat, what about that channel over there? Uh, too narrow, too rocky, no space to maneuver. Now we portage, then. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. The men will have to be on guard, according to our two nest first guides. They say the Indians in this region make their life work of stealing. We'll close the area to them. We'll post sentries with orders to shoot all intruders. Yes, sir. That's the only way. The portage wasn't difficult, and we made it without losing anything to the local thieves. After we had finished, Twisted Hare and Tito Harsky, our two Nez Perce guides, came to say their goodbyes. This was as far as they could go without risking their lives because the tribes below the falls were at war with the Nez Perce. We were warned to watch the coast Indians, who were a despicable lot. In fact, the downriver Indians, according to rumor, planned to murder us the first chance they got. We pushed on and two days later reached the Dalles, the long narrows of the Columbia, which was nothing but rapids, the worst we had encountered west of the Continental Divide. That sure is rough water. I know, Sergeant, but I don't want a portage again. I don't think there's much choice, Mayor Whitten. What did Cruzat say to you? He just whistled and shook his head. Unfriendly Indians are all around us. Look over there. There's a group on the river bank right now watching us. A portage will mean most of the men will be carrying boats and baggage and unable to defend themselves. 
That's when a smart chief would attack. What would we get Cruz out of here? Yes, sir. Cruz out? That's what you want to. You uh, work with me, sir? Can you or can't you shoot these rapids? Yeah, the water drops about 60 feet in two miles. That's very fast water. You think you'd have a chance in the canoe? Well, sir, I'd be willing to try it, but I wouldn't want anyone else to. They wouldn't make it, is that it? Yes, sir. I know it's asking a lot, but could you bring down every boat? I'll try it, sir, if that's your wish. Cruzat spent considerable time in studying the rapids, looking at them with an expert waterman's eye. The rest of us stood by respectfully, waiting for the signal that he was ready. Finally, he took over the first of the dugouts, sitting in it as if he were the intellectual part of a strange new creature, half man, half boat. Then, expertly, even with a certain amount of indifference, he guided the canoe into the fast water. Noticing everything, even the different tones of color of the water which spoke of the nearness of submerged dangers. He battled the currents, twisted past the rocks, all at a speed that seemed incredible to me. The Indians, forgetting to steal, watched in disbelief. Disbelief changed to admiration as our expert waterman made trip after trip through those treacherous rapids. When it was over and the wet and almost exhausted Cruzat was moving toward us, the men broke out in a spontaneous cheer. As we neared the Pacific, the weather became disagreeable, almost disagreeable as the boat loads of ill-favored Chinook and Clatsop Indians who paddled out to look us over. Then, on November 7, 1805, Meriwether Lewis pointed downriver. There it is, the Pacific. My eyesight was less keen. I couldn't see the ocean, but I could hear the pounding of the surf. The men showed little or no enthusiasm. Fog and rain were making us uncomfortable. A strong wind was flipping up the surface of the water, drenching us with spray. I can hardly see any more, Captain. Lay in the shore! Lay in the shore! Lay in the shore! Yeah, this is a miserable hey, wet spot. Hey. Captain, what'll I do for dry wood? Can't start no cooking fire here. Hand out some dried fish, then. Well, here it is. The Pacific. Yes, but what's Pacific about it? Our campsite that first night was the worst anyone could remember. We knew, however, that we had to rise above present miseries. Obviously, we would winter here. We would have to establish winter quarters and be on guard against the unfriendly, thieving Clatsops and Chinooks. However, we could be proud that we were the first white men and black to cross the vast American continent. Listening to Horizons West, the continuous.